you've been doing one other thing in the criminal justice system that has its own motivation but has, a, has an economic impact, and I want you to talk about that a little bit, if you would, which is, uh, which is pushing to get people out of the jail who really are just being held needlessly. There's other ways to do it. Uh, and the focus so, so, the jail on keeping the bad guys. So, so what I usually say is the jail is the, is the intersection of racism and poverty in this country. There are large numbers of people in our jail who have bond amounts but who can't make bond and so they're in jail. Now, judges decide whether or not you get bond. Okay, If, you, if you're there without bond, that's one thing. But 70% of the people in our jail are there for nonviolent, are waiting trial for nonviolent offenses. And many of them have bond, but they, but they can't make their bond. They spend that time waiting for trial in jail. And <clears throat> often the bond amounts are very modest. You know, a judge will set a $6,000 bond, which means you have to come up with $600 cash. But if you don't have $600 cash, you wait in our jail, and it costs us $143 a day to keep somebody in jail. We spend half a billion dollars a year on our jail half a billion out of a three billion dollar budget. Now you've been successful in cutting the population in the, at, the, at the Olati home, at the, the juvenile center. Have you, been, has you been able to cut the population in the jail? Well let me just say um, it's not fair to say that um, <laughs> I've been successful in cutting the population at the, at the juvenile temporary you detention won't. center. Well there were like 800 kids in the juvenile temporary detention center in 2000 and now the daily census is about 260. So what you have to say is, and, and I was in juvenile court this week, the juvenile court judges and the juvenile court system has worked hard over that decade to bring down the population, to provide services to kids in their communities, to provide alternatives to detention in the detention center, which is a youth prison. It's a terrible place. You should go there. Um, and they, they have all worked together, all, you know, the, the chief judge, the public defender, the state's attorney, the social service agencies. I was in a courtroom with a juvenile judge. He has a case manager. You know, they've all worked together to reduce that population, and we want to reduce it further. And our, our goal has been to support their efforts to reduce it further. But it's not fair to say that I, I just, it's happened in the last 18 months. It's been going on for a long time. We've done everything we can to accelerate the reduction. Okay. Has that happened at the jail, though? Is the population down? No, the population at the jail isn't down. Um, so here's some of the things we've tried to do. We, um, we put an emphasis on um, electronic monitoring and ask the chief judge to, to get more people to be on electronic monitoring. So this is how complicated it is. Two years ago, there were maybe 100 people on electronic monitoring on any given day, and now it's closer to 1,000. I think the last number I saw was in the high 800s. But twice as many people have been proposed for electronic monitoring as have actually gotten it. One of the reasons is that <clears throat> um, if you're going to be on electronic monitoring, you have to have an address. <coughs> if you're homeless, you don't have an address. Mm -hmm. So at the last board meeting, <coughs> we authorized spending money uh, to engage organizations like Safe Haven or Haymarket to provide housing for people who are homeless so they can be on electronic monitoring and not in the jail. Um, and if they're at Haymarket or Safe Haven, they'll also get services, for example, if, if they have substance abuse issues or if they uh, need employment assistance or whatever. So we're trying to, so putting people on electronic monitoring, good, we did that. We ratcheted dramatically the number of people on electronic monitoring, but it turns out there are obstacles to, to um, implementing that program fully, which we're now having to address by providing um, al alternative housing, residences, basically, for people who are homeless. So the other, one of the other issues, there are 102 counties in the state of Illinois. In Cook County, it takes the longest from arrest to disposition of your case of any of the other counties. And the gap is widening. So one of the things we're looking at is, why, why is there this disparity? Why is it that it takes so much longer from arrest to disposition in Cook County in contrast to the other counties? And that, of course, impacts the jail population because if it takes a long time from arrest to disposition, there are more people in our jail. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I've spoken out about early on was uh, the failure of the drug war. And uh, across racial groups, African Americans, Latinos, whites, they're about 8 to 10 percent of the population that uses illicit drugs. But if you look at our jail, the people who get arrested <coughs> and, and convicted on drug offenses are almost all African American and Latino. You actually talked about decriminalization earlier than some other people did. 
Yes. Well, I, it doesn't. What was happening is people were arrested for small amounts of marijuana possession, and then they'd they'd go to a preliminary hearing and it'd be thrown out, and and it was like 80 or 90 percent of the cases were thrown out. So what's the point of arresting people, having them stay in jail, many of them, and then you come to the preliminary hearing, you throw it out anyway. I mean, <laughs> so you've wasted all the police time, you've wasted the court time, and that's the judges and the bailiffs, the sheriff's people, the state's attorney, the public defender, you know, for a case you're going to throw out anyway. So if, if, if we're going to deal with, if we're going to deal with marijuana possession, let's just ticket people. <laughs>